Okay, uh, good evening, welcome to New Horizons. If you do have a mobile phone, if you would like to put it on silent, please, thank you. Right, a huge welcome and thanks to Tony Topping for stepping in at short notice as the arranged speaker couldn't make it. Tony's talk tonight is... The <laughs> <laughs> the paranormal identity. Yeah. Tony's talks come mostly from an experiential viewpoint, having been what can be described as bullied by unknown persons for his inquiring mind and strange contacts. Tony reveals more of his dealings with corrupt and secret agencies who he believes seek to silence and mind control him and others in similar situations. Please welcome Tony Topping. Thanks to the organisers, it was a last minute thing, uh, and you're very lucky because um, my name's Tony Topping. Uh, some of you may know me, some of you may not know me, but this is brand new material, material that you've not seen before. And the reason for that is actually the organisers behind this event that provoked this, uh, because uh, a few months back, well I think it was last year, maybe the beginning of last year, uh, 2013, they said, well Tony, your, your talk's absolutely brilliant, but you know, you've got everybody's research in there, but what happened to you? What's happening with you? What's going on with you? And what you'll see is that I've got in the media, I'm in the media quite a lot with all this, and um, this story is going to be, what I'm going to tell you is what really happened to me and what really goes on. And what we've got is we've got, the, we call this talk the paranormal identity. And the reason behind the, the reason why I call it the paranormal identity is because it's similar to the um, to the character Jason Bourne. Not that I'm like Jason Bourne, I'm, I'm nothing like him. But it's, it's similar to the uh, it's similar to the to the Jason Bourne scenario, where the three trilogies of the Bourne identity, the Bourne Ultimatum, which has a special resonance in me, uh, because he was part of a project, a classified project called the Black Briar. Uh, in the third Bourne Ultimatum, and a Guardian journalist discovers Project Blackbriar. And as we will see, I was part of a black operational project, the like of which um, people would, would just freak out about. So what I've got to do this evening is deliver it in such a way so that it's very simple, you understand, and so on and so forth. And part of this, and later on I'll pass these round, part of this is to do with my journals. Uh, which have been on my, well actually these have been on my shelf, this one has been on my shelf for eight years. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through what these journals are about, we're going to take you on a, on a journey and we need to define uh, so that you get a fuller, very modern understanding of what really, really goes on behind the scenes when a member of the public like me is liaising with people who are of an advanced nature. And you've no idea why they're speaking to you, you've no idea why they're coming to you. You, you, you could easily go down the route of, well, I am the chosen alien ambassador, but that is not the case. That is not what is happening. And uh, what's happening is I was part of an operation, it appears, and what I've done is I've gone through all my journals, and some of them, it's just absolutely staggering. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a, uh, an entry from one of my journals. I'll literally read you an entry from one of them a bit later on. Uh, which explains what happened to me. So, first things, I think the first things first within terms of UFO research. We have got to understand before we begin this story how the government uh, and how indeed aliens perceive each other. Because I'm, I'm in the know on this and I've been for a number of years, there are kind of like, this may sound bizarre, but there are protocols involved in governments speaking to aliens and so on and so forth. Our governments, as I'll tell you later, our governments are aware of what is happening with all this. And what we have to do is define the word foreign. Now what's, what you've seen there is a gentleman called Colonel Philip Corso, the guy with the glasses on, on the left. And what's happening there is he was responsible for the the integration of back engineered technology into society that we see today. I was talking, giving a lecture at Chesterfield um, only a few weeks back, and a gentleman came up to me who was part of a special study group, so he told me. Now, the guys who I've met before who have been involved in these so called special study groups will always come out with the usual bullshit of, oh, that's classified, I can't tell you that, oh, I can't say. And, and obviously, it's complete. Crap, because, and I do surprisingly, which I'll cover later, I get fantasist emails. I actually get emails from people pretending to be from the government and they know nothing about what's happening. And I'm not saying that I do, it's just that they know nothing about what really goes on and I've had to know it because of all my experiences spanning a number of years. So what is foreign? Well, 
The Colonel Philip Colso, uh, part of the Roswell UFO crash, when a UFO landed in Roswell, it crashed, they extracted technology from it, and they developed the transistor, and perhaps all the, the technology that we see today was reintegrated into American corporations like AT&T, IBM, Bell Howell, a few others, um, and it was, it was integrated by this guy. It is standard knowledge among people who work in these covert arenas that the transistor was a development of Roswell. And this guy at Chesterfield, who was part of this group, just said, yeah, absolutely, it was part of Roswell. It's standard information. We all knew that. It's the transistor is a development of Roswell. So what we've got to know further is that Philip Corso then indicated, because he was part of the US Army's Foreign Acquisitions Department, when you hear the word foreign, foreign acquisitions department, you think foreign as in France, foreign as in Paris. Oh, no, no. The American military perceived aliens as foreign, as in foreign technology, foreign acquisition, foreign everything about them, foreign government, foreign military, because that, as we will proceed into what's happened to me, that's exactly what they are, foreign. And they have to be perceived as such, because if I didn't perceive them, and if these guys didn't perceive them in that way, you wouldn't survive, and I, I nearly went insane. I, I've been to hell and back with it all. So this is my journey, what we're, what we're going to win. So I'll start at the very beginning. We're going to cover, of course, my journals, the past, my harassment that happened, mainstream media. I'm going to play you a clip of when I appeared on ITV this morning, and that's going to be the launch point from ITV this morning, what I said to presenter Philip Schofield and Ollie Willoughby. And then we're going to go into the whoosh, straight beyond that as to what the public don't see. Uh, and this is by popular demand from people who really wanted to know what the hell had gone on with me, and this is it. So, um, my first psychic incidents happened in Robert Street in uh, Selby, North Yorkshire, near York. And that's the place where it happened, down that street there. I had my first psychic incident at age two, where I had people walking through a wall. And of course, the outcome of the debunkers with the, oh no, 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 at two, um, no, you wouldn't be able to remember. I clearly remember. I have a visual recollection in precise real time of people, places, and events. And so I know what happened to me. I was screaming in my cot. My father was trying to put me back in the cot. I was screaming my bloody head off. I had my, uh, I cut my lip in the process. And I'm trying to plead with my father. I'm pointing at him like this. And I remember my dear father going, what, what are you on about, Anthony? There's nothing there. I'm putting me back in the cot. And there was, they'd walk through the ruddy wall. Um, so that was my first at age two. Uh, and little would I know as we go through this presentation where it's leading to, because it's, it's leading to somewhere. That's my father, and that's obviously me, the little Ewok on the right. Um, and, you know, we can, we can clearly see that's my dear mother, bless her. My father was potently psychic, absolutely potently psychic. He was a pro, so he told me, by the KGB when he served in the army in Austria. And as we'll see, we'll be looking at Russia a bit later through this lecture, but looking at Russia and the way their military look at UFOs in a radical, unorthodox way. So that's my father, and he was very good at um, healing hands. He would heal dead cats. He would bring back a lady's neuralgia. A lady came, in, uh, came into my house screaming in pain with neuralgia, and he would put her hands uh, on, on her and heal her. And it was all it was all very strange because he wouldn't smack me when I was eight. He'd just lay me out sparkle on the bed with a headache. So I'd be sparkle on the bed. I couldn't move with a black with a headache. And a lot of people found found this what I've just said there. They find it kind of like cruel. And it was really. He was a very difficult man to deal with. Um, and so. Moving from childhood, I had various incidents. Uh, I had a go at magic spells, actually. I started using the occult. I cast a magic spell on this gorgeous redhead girl, and uh, her fat sister wanted a date with me, which wasn't very nice. A big, ugly fat sister is like something just crazy. So, you know, it was, um, it was um, unbelievable. It really, it really was. And so my, um, my first UFO incident uh, was in 1992. Uh, and it happened over my house. I was keen on acting at the time, and what happened is, that's the house there. I do apologise for the state of the hedge and the garden. Uh, but that's, that's my house there. And um, coming over the top of that, uh, of that area there, that roof area, was like something out of Close Encounters. It was, it was rotating, it was like something out of Close Encounters. It was there for about five seconds, it switched off, it switched on, it went. I wandered around in the days for a couple of days wondering what the hell that was all about. So you see, they, as we lead through this presentation, you will understand that I was being tracked from about 1970 by them. I say them, we will go into who they really are, and it will astound you. So, that's my stage school. I went to the Academy of Live and Recorded Arts. Nothing really much happened between 92 
and me going to stage school. Nothing really would have happened. That's the Academy of Live Recording Arts, and I went to stage school. I studied there, and I began when I left stage school in about 93. I stayed in London. I started having some very strange incidents when I lived in London with UFOs of all things. Uh, including one at St Mary Cray when I was uh, nearly homeless and sleeping on a friend's floor. Uh, and I'm sure it happens to us all. But we, we had this thing, St Mary Cray, where the UFO would come in, a dot of light, it would come in uh, at speed and stop and fly off again. It was very bizarre and I, I couldn't help but notice this, that I was being followed by these little dots of light. I learned only recently, I saw one of these dots of light last month as to what they truly are, these little dots of light. It's quite astounding to see them in broad daylight, what they really are. But yeah, so St. Mary Cray Kent, coming over the roofs at speed, uh, tremendous speed, and Parade Street Paddington as well. And Parade Street Paddington is very interesting because I don't know whether you can see there, but right at the end, on the left, is a big tall building. And what happened just in the middle, what the hell's that in the middle? I haven't noticed that before. Gracious me, that's, uh, that's blown up, is that? Gosh, anyway, it might be a jet, but I wonder what that is. Just in the middle, um, it's kind of like, actually, where the original UFO was. It was a winter's night. I'm walking back from Lambrook Grove in about 94, 95, and all of a sudden, this white, bright white light appears from nowhere and goes across, like where that dot is in the middle, goes across there, and it looks as if it's going to crash into a block of flats. And I remember, I'm just about to run to a fire engine and go, look guys, it's going into, and it had gone, it had completely disappeared. Uh, and it left me, it was just baffling, just a, a baffling incident, one of many. Now little was I to know that I'm hurtling into a situation uh, that, that I am not aware of that's coming up in the years ahead, but I'm, I'm not aware of any of this, and my naivety would have consequences as well, as it always seems to do with all this, as a, a naivety. And, I was returning in 1996 to chaos. Um, I returned back to Selby, North Yorkshire in 96, and it began really with this very bizarre two balls of light flying across the backyard, um, an orange flash that woke up my mother, and then they just disappeared. And I was very, I was very shaken up by that because what happened next was a very strange shape went across the garden and said hello. And you can see, I'm sure you can share with me, even my puzzlement as I stand here speaking as to what's going on because you have to have an open, cynical mind. You cannot, you won't survive, you won't mentally get through the ordeal that's going to come up through this presentation of what I live through and what I am living through. You won't get through it unless you take things, um, unless you have a cynical mind and look at it objectively. So, yeah, so what happened then was in about 1990, uh, 1999, all kinds of strange things happened. And it, it was a bit of a return to chaos for me, because that is the UFO that started it all.
That's the UFO that came in over my house in 1999, and it caused absolute mayhem. It would appear that I was being monitored, and it would appear that they knew, they actually knew that I was being watched by these objects. We'll go into who they are. Uh, and it, it, an interesting pattern emerges when I reviewed my journals after a number of years. An interesting pattern emerges of what they were doing and what the UFOs were doing, which are two entirely different things altogether. Um, and it's all in the journals here. And so this UFO comes in and it illuminates a TV antenna. Um, and what, as it spins round, you can see that it's just going to go behind a tree. She knows I cannot see. It's a female pilot. Bizarre as that may seem, it's a female pilot. Actually, that's very important. The female's role in all this seems to be a constant theme in, in all interactions, including interactions with the Russian military. Very interesting. Anyway, so she's just going behind there, and she knows in a minute that I will be able to see her on camera. Uh, and so she'll back out again. Now, this went for image analysis with, um, with a special effects director on work on Jurassic Park. And he indicated that the thing was not giving off any original civil aviation traffic air sequence strobe lights as they normally do. It's off its approach corridor and Chris French on this morning said, oh it's a plane. It's not a plane, it's got reverse gears. The thing goes 360 degrees on its original turn, it will go backwards, sideways, it's hovering capability, it's noiseless and she's just going to go behind the tree. She realises her error and comes straight back out again. And this is the, the, what I call my primary UFO incident because that's what triggered what can only be described as harassment without oversight by some very unaccountable individuals. I do believe that it is actually a triangle craft that we're looking at there that's actually strobing its domes and hovering and reversing and so on and so forth. And it's very interesting, the people behind it, because the people behind it are people but they're not like us, and they're from somewhere else. And of course, we're going to get we're going to get the usual ridicule about that. But I'm not bothered because I've lived through this. I've had nearly a lifetime of it, and that's going to be part of the new material of the presentation as to who they are and what they are, which is which is all very interesting. So you see, she knows she's made a mistake. She comes out sideways. Now that that's an aircraft. If that's an aircraft, it's moving sideways. It's going like this, and it's rotating 360, and it'll fly back off in the original direction it came, as if it's flying backwards. And that triggered another series of bizarre events because I was walking back from a friend's house and in Channel, Channel 4, I think it'll be in August or, or July time, we've got to show um, in its eternity um, what happened to me at the various incident locations. Now what happened is you'll see that building there, I'll paint the picture for you, you're walking home, all of a sudden an unmarked green helicopter hovers at the height of that roof appears from bloody nowhere. In fact, it, uh, uh, my recollection of it is that it actually just rose up like that. It probably didn't, but it, it's as if it did. And it was, it was close on at me, really close on at me. I'm getting emotional because I'm recalling events. Yeah, it was close on at me. I'm just going to play you a clip of it in action and I'll explain a bit more about what it was doing. Here it comes now. Do, does any member of the audience, if we were to think out of the box, it's a military helicopter, based on what I've told you so far, would anybody have any ideas what he's doing? Notice it's got domes on it. And I'll explain all that in a minute. Any ideas at all what he might be doing with somebody like me, other than the fact... Sorry? Intimidating. Yeah, yes, that. Something else as well. He is intimidating, yeah. That's all part of it. But as you can see, he's doing a nice... Notice the, uh, the domes and all the stuff under it. The fact it's got a winch on the side of it, it's a very special helicopter. And that was a...